Hi everyone, it's Van Nico again with part two of the podcast with Jean-Francois. In our previous podcast, we covered in detail the uses of algae in research. In this podcast, we will go into detail on how algae are being used in bioplastics, and we also dive into the differences between bioplastics and petro-based plastics. So let's get started. So one thing that you were uh, mentioning before is like upscaling production and then that that is uh, quite difficult. So I was just uh, wondering um, whether if like so far it seemed the processes you've uh, described, they rely on like already existing uh, large scale production, like for example, with the starch where people are already producing this uh, in large quantities. Um, so I just wanted to ask if uh, you're also trying to bring like newer plastics that you're developing and upscaling those. We, we try to connect to the existing biorefinery schemes. So we, we, the industry doesn't want to change its tool and plants. So it's true for the fractionation of the biomass. It's true also for the transformation, for instance, of the, the material. If you consider the way plastics are manufactured and molded, for instance, people want to use the same machines. They don't want to change the machines to, to adapt to new generations of plastics. So this is something that you have to consider and to take into account during the development. It's not only a matter of bringing new plastics. You have to bring plastics that are affordable, and that are amenable and existing systems. Uh, we, we innovate in, I would say, in the, the steps and the, 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 that are not related to conversion, fractionation, and transformation. We innovate in systems that are used to grow the biomass, because this is something which is not totally linked and totally correlated with the downstream processing. So this is where we can innovate with the systems, with the photobioreactors, also with the way we manage the photobioreactors in order to, to, to bring more um, automation and monitoring in the system, because currently the algae industry uh, asks for a lot of expertise and a lot of uh, manpower because uh, usually these are small systems and small companies, so there is a lot of knowledge and know-how, but there's, there are no real processes, industrial processes, compared to other fields of industry. If you consider the way the chemical plants or the, or the fermentation or biochemical plants are, are conducted, this is very far from the practices that are involved currently in the microalgae industry. And this is where there is a level of innovation uh, of, I would say, transfer, apply knowledge from other fields of industry in order to get a better control of the process, in order to also to improve the tools that are used to grow the algae. And so the polymers that are produced from algae, are they biodegradable and how are they broken down? Uh, so all the biopolymers that are produced from microalgae are biodegradable. They are natural. So they, they, they are built by enzymes that are contained in the microalgae, but also they can be broken down by the similar enzymes or, or also by enzymes that are contained in other organisms. So this is totally biodegradable. This is uh, bio-based, uh, bio-produced, and biodegradable. And also this is natural. And this is very important if you consider the, the evolution of the, um, um, I'm sorry, 
Uh, if you consider the way the, 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 the legislation in Europe on single-use plastics is uh, moving, single-use plastics are not allowed anymore unless they are based on natural polymers. And in this case, the only natural polymers that you have in the basket are starch, cellulose, chitin, uh, proteins from living organisms, uh, polyesters from bacteria, and that's all. Nothing else is allowed. So people have decided to move from plastic to paper, for instance, for wrapping things. People have decided to move from plastics to wood for making single-use cutlery. Uh, but there are also some options to make still plastic systems, but based on natural polymers. And this is where this is very time. This, this is time to develop this type of thing because the the, the, the legislation has totally changed in uh, in Europe. So there is a, a real need from the market to bring solutions for this because uh, i don't know if you have already tested the the, the wood made single use cutlery but this is not very comfortable when you eat something which is always uh, quite trash so you you need this type of plastic things but bio based for this specific application i mean before uh, i just wanted to quickly ask about the degradability of these uh bioplastics because i mean can i just put them on into the bio waste uh, like in the in the garden um where then the like it will then within like a couple of days it will just uh, become earth like uh, i don't know the waste from uh, fruit and uh, vegetables Uh, so there are some standards for this, and uh, there, there are some specific um, films, for instance, that are, uh, or molded parts that are developed and that are uh, um, adapted to the home compost standards. So there are different solutions depending on the on the biopolymer that will be part of the resin, and depending also on the way the formulation is made. You can have something which can be biodegraded directly in your garden or in your bin, or something that will need to to be treated in under industrial composting processes, or something that will be totally durable, meaning that it will last for several years. So there are different scenarios, and this is where all the science related to formulation and also to the way the plastic systems are, are made. If you consider multi-layers, -year for instance, there are different layers that are not degradable at the same extent and under the same kin kinetics. So there are different solutions. But you, st you can make home compost for sure, starting from starch-based plastics or from uh, polyhydroxyalkanoids polyhydroxybutyrates, for instance, they will degrade directly in, when transferred to the garden. That's uh, very simple. I mean, it definitely sounds like a great alternative to um, the plastics that we tend to use on a day-to-day -day basis, like polyethylene, which are really hard to degrade. But how does the cost compare to the production of the bioplastics made out of algae to making um, making the polymer in a chemical way or non-bio um, bio way, and also the degradability. Um, how does the cost compare? The, the, the bio-based plastics currently are quite expensive. So we the, the, the first target is not to compete with uh, petro-based polymers. The first target is to compete with bio, other bio-based polymers. And in this case, the bio-based polymer, they are between five and seven euros per kilo. So this is a reasonable target for something based on uh, algal material. And what's the price of a petro-made uh, chemical? 
petrol-based uh, polymers are between one and two euros per kilo. So they are clearly less expensive. Uh, they have also a specific advantage, they are recyclable. And biodegradable plastics are not recyclable. So this is a different end of life scenario, actually. Either you recycle, but you have first to, to collect and to sort and separate, or you develop biodegradable things that are single use. These are two different scenarios. And I think uh, both solutions need to be considered in order to solve the, 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 the environmental problems. Uh, recycling is also a very good solution. And in, in this case, recycling bio, uh, uh, petrol based systems or polyolefins based on the natural resources is a good option. Would we ever be able to recycle bioplastics? Is that possible? Or will it ever be possible? If you incorporate into the definition of bioplastics, the polyolefins, for instance, that would be produced from natural resources, biopolypropylene or biopolyethylene, in this case, yes, we can recycle. Because the final polymer is the same as the petrobase. As the petrobase. Okay. Okay. But any bioplastic that needs a bacteria to like break it down or an enzyme those would never be able to be recyclable yeah they, it's it's quite difficult because these are either polyesters or polysaccharides so these are polymers that are not very stable to recooking remelting and then they need to be dried to a very high extent in order to be reprocessed. So this is quite difficult actually to reprocess. This is true also for other uh, petro-based polymer that are polycondensate. The, 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 the petro-based polyesters and the petro-based uh, polyamides, for instance, they have this uh, hydrolytic stability problem that is a problem for recycling. I mean, talking about recycling, is there like some general way plastics are being recycled nowadays? Like, uh, because you always hear about uh, the like uh, amount of plastic waste being produced, like the oceans being full of plastic waste, make microplastics making their way into everything. So I, I, I felt like there's like no real um, cyclic uh, in, or like what do you call this, like um, life there's no life cycle for plastics that goes from like that feeds it back into production then so is this something that's being developed yeah things are getting better it's uh it's a matter of education it's a matter of uh, organization also it's a matter of developing the, the sorting systems or sorting material but things are getting better and uh uh, there are, if you consider waste processors, for instance, uh, since uh, some years, there are also plastic producers. Uh, and they produce several tens of thousand tons of plastics every year out of the waste that they collect. They collect different types of waste. They separate plastics and they recycle and finally they sell pellets again and this has become a business for them so things are increasing things are moving the, the problem is uh, what ends up in uh, in the environment and what is uh, disposed everywhere in fields in river and that is not collected this is a real problem yeah okay but then i mean wouldn't like um bioplastics be more of a solution to this? Because if they're also biodegradable, even if they are left in the environment, then they wouldn't <clears throat> like stay there forever. Yeah, it's only part of the solution because uh, bioplastics are not able to do everything. Uh, if you, you want to, 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 to have some specific technical properties, uh, you may need part of... Uh, 
not biodegradable plastics. The, the, uh, the, the, the formulating a whole part with biodegradable things, for instance, will not be adapted to uh, wrapping food, for instance. You will need a, a barrier coating of this type of thing, and, and this will not be biodegradable. So there are some limits. You cannot do everything with biodegradable plastics because plastics uh, need also sometimes to be durable and to have some very specific technical properties that you cannot so far attain with bio-based or biodegradable plastics, I would say. So on the topic of properties, how do the properties of bioplastics differ from the properties of petrol-based polymers or plastics? Can you achieve different properties? And if you take the exact same polymer, just made in a different way, will it also have different properties or not? The ideal target is to mimic the properties of the petrol-based plastics and to, to have an end, of, an end of life that will be biodegradation. This is what uh, the industry started to develop, for instance, with PLA with polylactic acid. Uh, PLA is uh, quite durable. It's quite good, technically speaking. And uh, it can be biodegraded under industrial conditions. So it's a nice idea. I would say it's a nice scheme, but it's not totally adapted to the actual state of our societies because PLA cannot be easily sorted and separated from other plastics, for instance. And uh, uh, since PLA needs industrial composting, uh, it's quite difficult to define the bin where you will dispose of PLA, for instance. You cannot put it into the degradable garbage can. You cannot put it into the plastic garbage can because it will not be separated upon sorting. So it was a nice idea at the beginning, but there are some limits. So uh, I think we will always need the, the, the polyolefins, for instance, the polypropylene and the polyethylene, uh, and we can move to bio-based polypropylene and bio-based polyethylene. Of course, these will not be biodegradable, but uh, they, they can be recycled. So you don't think that it will be ever possible to get like a, a substitution of every um, like plastic that is not biodegradable? Um, like, for example, uh, working in a wet lab, we use a lot of plastics and I, uh, they have to have like the characteristic of not interacting with the, um, the liquids and materials. We pipe it into them, of course. So I think they, they need to have uh, yeah, quite uh, um, like good properties. Uh, and so, but you don't think this will be possible to substitute them uh, all at some point? I, uh, no, I don't think so. I think uh, the, you will, will still need, and, and this is quite a good use of um, either natural resources of petro or petroleum to produce this type of plastics. As long as there is a, a good organization of uh, collecting and sorting and recycling, this is where the, 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 the main issue is. And um, Regarding the, the, your question about microplastics, for instance, uh, a lot has been done in order to decrease the amount of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, plastic beads that are used in that used to be incorporated into cosmetics. This is not uh, allowed anymore. So, so I think gradually the amount of uh, non-biodegradable plastics that end up in the environment will decrease. That basically means that through the, the legislation, a lot of the plastics that have been used before are now being either shifted or uh, forbidden so that the environment uh, has, ends, or less plastic ends up in the environment, if I understand correctly. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, 
of course there are some limitations to this approach if you consider the, the way we live today with the disposable masks for instance all these are based on polyethylene and polypropylene and this is a single-use plastic but uh, there is no other option today so it's a kind of bridge to the legislation because we shouldn't use single-use masks in order to protect from COVID. <laughs> but that's a matter of emergency. <laughs> so could, could we make masks out of bioplastics? Yeah, we can, of course. This, this is a very nice example of something that you can do with bioplastics. The problem is cost here and uh, clearly the, the polymer is too costly to do this at the moment so how many um if we think percentage wise how much of the plastic that we use today is actually made out of bioplastics it's a very small amount it's uh, only a few few percent which is currently bio-based but uh, this small amount is increasing quite quite fast so this is a small market, but expanding quite fast. It grows up uh, about 20 to 25 percent per year in Europe. So there is a real development of this type of thing. But so far, it's a, a small part of the plastic. And the reason why it's so small is mainly due to the cost, right? Because it seems like the technology is advancing very quickly and a lot of it is already there. Yeah, it's a matter of cost. It's also a matter of, uh, I would say, age. It's a young industry. So it's growing up and you it's time to grow up. It's not like the petrol-based industry, which is, uh, I would say, almost 100 years old. And there is a clear, clear movement in, there is a clear move in Europe to switching from the petro-based industry to the to the bio-based industry to also to a co2-based economy because we don't have a lot of uh, fossil resources in europe but we have co2 as all the people in the world and this is a good option to start from co2 and to grow biomass or to use directly co2 in order to produce chemicals and materials so there are really, really a lot of projects uh, currently in Europe, right? both R&D and also industrial projects. So would you say that Europe uh, has, uh, um, or the European Parliament has uh, recognized that this is something they need to invest in, uh, that it's important for uh, the future and that they're actually putting more funding into it in recent years, I guess? Yeah, there is more more funding going there, and uh, they, they they consider this uh, as an opportunity. So, and not only Europe. I mean, all all the the continents and uh, the way the regulations are currently moving in Europe are opportunities also for other areas in the world. Meaning that there are, for instance, uh, factories in America or in Asia that are expanding because there is a need in Europe for this type of solution. So the, the, the challenge here is to, to develop things in Europe, made in Europe for the European market, because things are moving also elsewhere in the world. And we may end up with a, a natural-based or CO2-based polymers that will be imported and, uh, and no more industry in Europe which is not a good option. So currently right now, when you buy something at the supermarket or you use plastic and it's made from bioplastics, is there a sign that says it's made out of bioplastics or is that still to come? Uh, there's no label for bioplastics. There are some labels for the end of life, for instance. There, uh, you can have a label saying this is home compost. Uh, Agreed, for instance. Uh, sometimes people add a sentence, but this is free to add. They say this plastic is made out of uh, 
starch coming from potato, this type of thing. But this is not uh, mandatory. Do you think a lot of people are aware of the fact that we there is a difference between the way you make plastics, bioplastics and petroplastics? Or do you think in general we still need to try to increase people's awareness? I think the, the, the type of sentence that is written, for instance, on, on bags in the supermarket saying that uh, these bags come from natural resources or these bags come, can be recycled or you can return this bag to the, to, the, to the shop and we will recycle it for you. These are good options in order to increase the awareness. Uh, the, the, the problem is that there are no uh, large uh, advertising campaigns. You, you don't hear this type of message, for instance, in, in the media, on TV, or, but at least it's written on the, on the things that you, you use for uh, buying things at the supermarket. So there is a limited message. It could be increased in order to, to, to increase people's awareness, but uh, it's not totally uh, nothing. There are some, some messages there. Okay, so basically the advertisement is still missing and uh, in order to uh, actually get people to maybe invest more into this uh, industry um, and also like seeing its potential as with the microalgae being really productive, um, the people just need to know more about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, I think the, the professional and the, 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 the business are aware of the opportunities and they are also aware of the, 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 the regulation and the way the European regulation are gradually changing. Uh, but, the, the, but the consumer are not aware of this. So the, the ban on single-use plastic, you can hear it maybe uh, for several days in, in the news and then everything vanishes and you end up with other information. So there's no permanent message about this. Um, and so the way to make bioplastics in the whole area of bioplastics, is that big worldwide or would you say that the majority of the research is done in Europe? Uh, I think there is a lot of research and good research which is made in Europe, but uh, uh, research is also developing elsewhere in the world. And, uh, uh, and potentially also to answer the needs of the European market. So this is what I was saying when I said that there are some factories that are built also elsewhere. Because uh, if you consider, for instance, the way the PLA industry expanded, uh, the PLA industry expanded close to the, the areas where sugar feedstock is the most accessible, the most affordable. So this is where, for instance, sugarcane grows. So it can be it can be in Brazil, it can be in uh, in Asia, uh, and these plastics end up in, on the European market. So innovation can start in other parts of the world in order to answer market needs that are more uh, focused in Europe because uh, the regulation in Europe are moving faster with respect to everything related to biodegradation and environmental friendly things. But I think the, the yes, research in Europe is quite dynamic. Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's more a matter of having the, the good access to the right feedstock in order to develop the industry. Because the, 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 the lands in Europe are limited. It's a, highly populated region. Uh, it's also lands uh, should be more devoted to growing food and feed for people and not growing polymers for plastics. So this is where the, the, the seaweed and the algae have a potential because the, these are underexploited resources and underexploited areas in Europe compared to other parts of the of the world
basically we the we need to change uh, to see co2 not as a waste product but actually as a resource that we can use in europe um, to produce uh, new biomaterials yeah true yeah it would produce new crops and produce new biomaterials yeah for sure but yeah as my final question so can you give us a prediction of like in the next 10 years how will how much will the use of bioplastics increase i told you that it's growing 20 percent per year so you can make the calculation yeah. <laughs> yeah, if yeah. you consider the same same increase it's really a big increase for an industry uh, if you consider even the way the the food industry for instance expands uh, worldwide it it grows 5 to 7% per year not more uh, whereas the plastic industry grows 1 or 2% but the bioplastic industry grows more than 10 20% per year so it's growing 10 times faster than the usual industry so i think we in the the 10 10 years from now we we will have hopefully several hundred thousand of tons of bioplastics produced and used in europe and that that will be a big increase from the current situation because currently what we have which is bio-based and biodegradable and they produce in Europe are only starch-based materials. Um, even the polyesters, the aliphatic polyesters, they are not made in Europe. They are produced in Asia, either polyalkanoates or polylactic acids are produced in other parts of the world. So we don't have any domestic industry with respect to this and we need to, to develop this. Okay, yeah, that was that was all very, very interesting. I definitely learned a lot. What about you, Nico? Yeah, it was really nice to talk about this, especially with sustainability becoming like more and more relevant. Also, the Max Planck Society is planning to become more sustainable, uh, talking to our vice presidents. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing where this field will go. Yeah, me, yeah, me too. And, and, you, and, and they, they will need chemists, you know. It's not only biology, so <laughs> you can keep on studying chemistry. It's uh, there's a lot <laughs> to do with chemistry. <laughs> that's good. That that's good to know for me. It's not a, the total. It's not the total vanishing of the chemical industry. It's only a, a move to something bio-based. That's all. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much for uh, joining us today and for talking to us about such an interesting and highly relevant topic. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks Thanks a lot for the invitation. And uh, I hope to, to see you soon, one time, when we are free to travel to different parts of the world. <laughs> that sounds great, yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe Maybe in a few years wearing a biodegradable mask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's the mm -hmm. target. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then maybe do you want to tell, I don't know if you um, use LinkedIn or you use Twitter and you want to tell uh, the audience where they can keep up to date and stay up to date with your research? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I have a personal uh, LinkedIn account. So under my name where I post information about our research. Uh, and we have also a website, which is uh, the website of the organization. So as I told you, CEA is a large organization. And CEA doesn't stand only for algae, but for different fields. So we are not very visible on the website of CEA. So go to my LinkedIn profile. That would be better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we will link to all the things in the episode descriptions for the uh, listeners then uh, to find. Yep. Thanks for the conversation and have a good day. Good life. That's it. We really hope you have enjoyed the podcast with Jean as much as we did. We definitely learned a lot and we hope you did too. If you like our podcasts, make sure to follow us on our Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram pages, where you will find us under the name Offspring Magazine. 
And make sure to follow Jean-Francois on LinkedIn to stay up to date with his research. You can find him under his name, Jean-Francois Sussy. Thank you so much again for listening. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group, known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srina Thrankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye!